Turn with me, please. They'll put it up on the screen as well. In the scripture, two verses we've been looking at for the last few weeks. First Samuel, the second chapter. First Samuel 2. If you didn't bring a Bible, the usher, ushers have Bibles. You'd raise your hand real high. They have uh, extra Bibles. They'd be glad to let you use one of these. Hold your hand up real high. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2 and 30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, God doesn't change. He is the Lord God. He changes not. And he's not the Son of Man that he should repent. But he will change what he does on some things, depending on what people do or don't do. Well, in that case, who changed? Man. It wasn't him that changed. His will's the same. His plan's the same. His ways are the same. But uh, it, we went into some detail on this uh, a number of months ago, talking about uh, You Choose is the title of a series that we were into for a while. Uh, how that God is not controlling everybody and everything. This, this idea that God is in control. And by that I mean everything that happens is somehow under and by the control of God is simply not true. I said it is not true. The truth is, there are all kind of things happening in this planet that have nothing to do with God, that are not His will, that don't please Him, they're not His plan, they're actually contrary to Him, His will and His plan. And the truth is, unless you ask Him, unless somebody asks Him to get involved and believes Him to get involved in so many things, He's simply not in it. Are y'all with me? Now, it didn't take long to say that, but that is radically different than how many church-going people believe. Hmm? But don't just take my word for it. If that sounds new to you, uh, get that serious and get in there and get immersed with this. It's called uh, You Choose. Did I say it right? You Choose. And there's a bunch of sessions. And go through the scriptures with us and, and see it. Let the word talk to you and minister to you. There's a lot of tradition of men that we need to get free from. Amen. A lot of stuff that people have heard in church Amen. that just ain't so. Right. Hmm? So uh, the Lord says here, you can see, He said this was going to be this way, but now it's going to be this way. Well, He didn't change His mind. God didn't change. He said, I'm going to honor the ones that honor me. Well, whose choice was it whether they honored him or not? Hmm? I, I had some people, heard some people railing about some things. They said, well, if God really exists and he really is love, how's a, a God who is love going to send human beings to a place of eternal hell and torment? What kind of God would do that? And some years ago, thinking about, well, Lord, if, how, how do I answer that as one of your ministers? How do I answer that question? And I mean just as clear, I don't mean I heard a voice, but just as clear inside me, he said, it's not my choice. That's right. That's right. That's right. You believe that or not? Yeah. Which, that actually set me on the course of studying the Word that produced some of these series like you choose. That was some of the very impetus that put me on the course. Because if that's true, 
So again, I asked myself the question, I, I believed it was him, but I need to see it in the Word. Amen. Right? Amen. It's, not, it's not his choice. It's not his choice. Well, there's a whole lot of things that's not his choice. He really has given us a free will. Well, how is it his fault if we choose wrongly? Huh? It's not. So God's not sending people to hell. People are simply choosing not to be with him. Well, if you don't want to be with him, you're not going to like the other place. Right? But if you're going to blaspheme and reject him and despise him, that's where you wind up. And it wasn't his choice. How many want to choose him and everything he has for you? Huh? Say it out loud. It'd be a good thing for you to say it publicly. Out loud. Say it out loud. Lord, Lord I choose you. I choose you. <laughs> everything within me, my, my heart, my will, my soul, my desire, it's my choice to believe you and to follow you. Come on, say it again. I choose you. I choose Jesus. I choose the Master. I choose the Father, the Creator of heaven and earth. I choose God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. He said, them that honor me, I will honor and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, uh, one of the greatest ways that God honors us is with his presence. Go with me to the book of Psalms, please. Psalm 139. One of the greatest ways that God honors us is with his presence with his manifested presence. What if you're having a birthday party? Or you're having some kind of gathering? We're having some kind of meeting or some kind of service. And this famous, internationally known, beloved person shows up at it. Comes to it. Did they honor you? By coming to your function, by being a part of your thing. Yes, they have honored you greatly. They didn't have to show up there, right? By them showing up there and being there, they've honored you. Well, there's none greater than the Lord our God. And for Him to show up <laughs> at a thing... And by that I mean to manifest his presence there right. is of the greatest honor that can be bestowed. Who's he going to honor like that? From our text, who's he going to honor like that? It's not indiscriminate. It's not random. There's a connection. Hmm? There's a reason. Why God manifests himself more in some places than other places. Why is it? Come on, tell me from the scripture. Why is it? Because some people honor him more than others. Right? Who's he going to honor? Those that honor him. Those that honor him. Now, God is in spirit everywhere. But he's not manifested in the same measure, to the same degree, everywhere. Psalm 139 talks about this. Psalm 139, 7. He says, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? Keep going. If I ascend up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Keep going. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, then the night will be light about me. 
The darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now that's interesting. Why would that be? Huh? Because when he gets there, <laughs> I don't care how dark it was or how long it was dark. Before he got there, when he gets there, it's not dark anymore because he is light. That's, so the darkness and the light are light, just alike to him. <laughs> the Bible tells us in time to come that the new heavens and the new earth, we're not even going to have a sun. We're not going to need one because the lamb is the light. Yes. Isn't that something? Yes. Hallelujah. But now we know it said, if I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. But how many think the presence of God is not sensed the same in hell as it is in heaven? <laughs> you can't say God doesn't know anything about it or he's not aware of anything because he is there by virtue of his, his omnipresence. But he is not perceived the same. He is not sensed the same. He is not manifested the same everywhere. There are places on this planet, in this earth, that are dark spiritually. If you flew over there, uh, there's some places in this country that ain't that hot. I mean, you, you go and you step off and you would feel like this is a God forsaken place. You would think, man, God ain't here. And yet he is. You can't say he's not there in the sense that he doesn't exist there. His spirit is there simply not manifested, not made known not revealed. Anybody with me? He is everywhere around us. And in Romans, put this up on the screen for us. Romans 1 and 19. You just stay there in Psalms. We, we got more things to see in Psalms. But in Psalm 119, he said, That which may be known of God is manifested in them or to them. For God has showed it to them. Now this is talking about unbelieving people. Verse 20. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are what? Clearly, Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. When people say there is no evidence of God. There is no proof of God. That is a big fat lie. Amen. Everything you see Amen. is evidence of God. Right. I'm talking about creation. Amen. The fact that there's a planet, yes. the, the mountains, the oceans, the trees, the flowers, you, me. Amen. Right. Hmm? Amen. How'd they get here? See, that's why there's such a push to take God out of it. Yes. Hmm? Yep. But it's a willing ignorance. Nobody, people say, well, we, 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 we've removed God. We don't have to. We have science now. We have understanding. We have the Big Bang. What caused the Big Bang? Huh? We know, we know about the origin of life. No, you don't. You can follow conception. You can follow how the babe develops in the womb. But what makes the baby go from stage one to stage two? Hmm? You can't see the origin of life under a microscope. We can see that sure, the, the, we've learned a few little things. Not much compared to what there is to know. But you can find, yeah, this nerve impulse comes from this region of the brain, makes the heart pump, you know, and, and this causes, yeah, but what is fueling it from the inside? What, what's in the, you, and if you don't understand the word, you know that the brain is not the mind. 
It's just a physical organ. When people say, isn't it amazing? All of these creations, all of the art and music and engineering and everything has come out of these couple of pounds of gray tissue matter. <laughs> no, it didn't. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Amen. The, the brain is a physical organ. If, you, if, if your brain was surgically removed, you'd still be you and you'd still have your mind. Right. You just couldn't express yourself exactly. in this physical realm. And Lord tears is coming just that much longer. After your body is decomposed and gone in the ground, you will still be you with your mind. Come on, are you listening to me? In fact, you'll be more, more brilliant than you've ever been. <laughs> Do you believe there's more to you oh, yes. than a physical body yes. and a physical brain? Well, the father of spirits has created spirit beings. Thank you, Lord. And you are not, and I are not just created beings, angels, but we are also born of him. We are his own sons and daughters in his family. Being actually... Earth is prep school. It is. He's prepping us for what comes next. We're being uh, groomed to be kings and priests and to rule and reign with him in the ages to come. What an honor. Somebody say what an honor. What an honor. But here and now, in this world, full of darkness, we, we saw last time God does hide himself. Isaiah talks about that. But also, he is a God who reveals himself. It's just, he doesn't reveal himself to everybody. Hmm? Amen. And he doesn't reveal himself to everyone to the same degree. Is it an honor for God to manifest himself to you yes. and to your family, in our, in our church, in our services, in our houses, right? Is it an honor? Yes. Who's he going to do that for and who's he going to do that more for? Those who, those who honor him and those who honor him more. Do you have a desire yes. to honor him more than you ever have yes. so that he has access to you, right? And is able to reveal himself and manifest himself more to you than he ever has before. In uh, uh, the scripture we looked at uh, last time, in John 14, put that up on the screen for us, please. John 14 and 20. You believing with me this evening? Hmm? Jesus said, at that day you shall know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He's talking about the day you and I live in right now. Is he in us? Yes. Are we in him? Yes. Keep going. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will what? Manifest. Manifest myself to him. Amen. Reckon you could count on what the Lord said. Yeah, every time. He said, you do this and I'm going to manifest myself to you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we know he doesn't fail. So we don't need to work on his part of begging him to manifest himself to us. Amen. Hmm? We need to work on our part, which is doing what he told us to do. Now, it, it, when he says, keep my commandments, don't immediately let your mind go to the uh, Ten Commandments. But also in, in remember what he said in 1 John. In fact, just, just turn there. Go to 1 John. Thank you, Lord.
third chapter. Verse 21, 321, he said, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Why? Because we keep his commandments. And we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now let's just stop right here. Can you think of anything that pleases God? One thing jumps to mind, right? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And you actually see that in the very next verse here, right here. This is his commandment. Here is the New Testament summary of keeping God's commandments. This is his commandment. What? Number one, that you do what? Believe. That you believe. There's faith in it. That you believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And number two, do what? Love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, if we'll do these, verse, verse 24, and he that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. Somebody say, you mean we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore? You do this and you will keep them. Amen. Hmm? If I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. Right? right? I'm not going to lie to you or own you. Huh? I'm not going to covet what you have and try to take it away from you. Or, uh, the Bible said in Romans, it says that uh, uh, love is the fulfilling of the command. And you, he that walks in love, you, you'll do your neighbor no harm. Amen. Right? Amen. So if I love the Lord God with all my heart and all my mind, soul, and strength, if I believe in the one he sent, Jesus, and, and I love you with the love he's put in me, I am in doing that going to keep the commands of, of God. Amen. And, and when I do that, what's, he, what's Jesus going to do? Y'all been keeping up? Huh? If I keep his commands by doing that, what's he, what's he going to do? He is going to manifest himself to me. Would I know it if God manifested himself to me? Now, if we read the rest of that passage, uh, one of the disciples spoke up and said, Now, Lord, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And he repeated if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. And my, the Father will come. We'll make our abode with you. And you, going back to the previous verse, I'll manifest myself to him. I'll make myself real and clear to him. Now we're given an example uh, uh, quoted in the New Testament referring back to the Old Testament of God's manifested presence. We need to go back. Did you know a you make a mistake if you neglect the Old Testament. Amen. The writers of the New Testament assume you know the Old Testament. Amen. They're continually referring to it. And we, anybody know what we're reading in these days? Yes. The Old Testament. Are you getting anything out of Genesis? Yes. Is it rich? Yes. It is. It's the Word of God. Yes, it is. It's rich, rich, rich. And so, uh, obviously, the New Testament letters are written to us, and we should pay a special interest to them, and we have. That's why we read the New Testament several times through the last few years, but we should not neglect the Old Testament, which is why we're reading it through now for the next couple of years here, and uh, then we'll read the New Testament through again several times. That's, that's our custom and practice. But uh, the, every, every word God has spoken is light, and life and eternal. And so in the, in the New Testament, it talks about how God manifested his presence in this particular passage. Go back to uh, well, a couple of passages I'm going to link together. Go to Exodus, please. Exodus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Did you say you're believing with me or not? Did you? We better pray and release some more faith. 
Hmm? You're going to Exodus 3. I, I can't do a thing of myself. Don't know anything worth telling you of myself. But thank God I'm not by myself. And you're not by yourself, right? <laughs> and you, did you know this on the other side of it? No matter how wonderful it was that we could tell you, you couldn't get it by yourself. <laughs> you need help. Did you know that? Come on, tell your neighbor, say, you need help. You need help. You need serious help. But then you need to turn around and tell them, I have help. I have. Huh? I've got big time help. Is that right? You've got the helper. Don't you? The Holy Spirit. But without his help, uh, you and I wouldn't get anything accomplished this evening. Wouldn't be anything ministered. Wouldn't be anything received. But the more we're aware of him and the more you and I yield to him, the more is accomplished. And what God does, it's forever. It's not just something happening on a Friday night. It's forever. Let's release our faith further in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're acknowledging you. All of our eyes are on you here and in Branson and everybody joining us by the internet. We release faith and, and are asking for utterance, strong, clear, precise, and ears to hear, and eyes and hearts and minds that perceive and understand. No matter where we might be in our walk and understanding, the Holy Spirit is so great of a teacher, He can make it plain and clear to all of us. In Jesus' name, we believe we receive it, and we say we'll not just be hearers only, nor forgetful hearers, but we'll be doers. And when we do, we will be blessed because you always watch over and perform your word in our lives that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So be it. In Exodus, the third chapter, Moses had run away from Egypt because of things that had happened there. He thought his brethren would understand that God was calling him to be a deliverer, but they didn't. <laughs> you know, God doesn't tell everybody else what he called you to do. <laughs> you know, Joseph told his brothers his dream. I think there's probably years he thought about and said, I wish I hadn't told him that. <laughs> but in the end, God still brought it to pass. And that's what's happening here with Moses. Decades have passed. And now Moses is older. But in verse 1, Exodus 3, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. How many believe this really happened? Yes. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Amen. It's burning, the flames rolling, but it's not being burnt. This is a sign, isn't it? You know, a lot of people would say impossible. And that just shows pride and ignorance. You don't understand why so-called laws exist in the first place. How are you going to say that whoever brought them into being couldn't adjust them? <laughs> or suspend, right? If you can't explain how it became that way, then you just need to be quiet and say, there's a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. Boy, there's so many things going on here. You know, some things if you don't respond to, you're not going to find out what comes next. What if he had just got scared and run away? But when the Lord saw what? That he's responding to this and coming to see it. God called to him out of the midst of the bush and he said, Moses, Moses. You know, the Lord knows your name. 
And Moses said, I'm here. I'm here. Keep going. And he said, draw not nigh hither. That's King James. Don't come any closer. We'd probably say. Put off the shoes from off your feet. For the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, is this a manifestation of God in the earth? Oh my. You couldn't say that the day before or the year before out in that region, backside of the wilderness, that God wasn't there. He was there. We read in Psalm 139, where can you go? And you say, God can't see me here. God's not here. God doesn't know what's going on here. How many remember that Jonah uh, went and bought a ticket on the boat to get away from the presence of the Lord. Anybody remember that? How'd he come out with that? How'd that work out for him? Huh? Can you run away from God and get away from him? Like, like the psalmist said, if I take the wings of the morning, I go to the furthest part of the sea. You can get on the fastest plane. You can go to the most remote isolated island. You can hide behind the palm tree. And God will say, hey, what are you doing here? How many of you can't get away from God? It is a foolish, futile endeavor to run away from Him. What was He running? Notice the phrase. He was, he was trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. And here, the presence of the Lord is manifested in a burning fire. And then here comes the voice in the presence and speaks to him. And it shook him. And he was, apparently he closed his eyes. He looked down, he looked away. He was afraid to look. That it'd be too much for him. And what did the Lord tell him? This is an interesting thing you and I need to meditate on tonight. What did the Lord tell him? Hmm? Verse 5, y'all with me? Don't come any closer. And what else? Take your shoes off. Take your shoes off. Why take your shoes off? Hmm? You know, a lot of things that modern church-going people would tell you don't matter, God don't care about, He actually does. Hmm? Wonder how many folks would tell you, God don't care if you got your shoes on or not. That's ridiculous. He cared today out here by this bush. Didn't He? <laughs> Y'all are quiet. Are we reading scriptures? Yes. Should, we, should we understand what's going on with these things? The same kind of thing happened more than once. In Joshua 5, you don't have to turn there, they'll, they'll put it up for us. Joshua 5, 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, and he was in a juncture in his life where he's having to take the leadership role that uh, Moses had, and I'm sure he's feeling the weight and the responsibility of it, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, think about it. You're following behind somebody that uh, spoke to God personally and, and heard the voice and the similitude of God and hung out with God on the mount for a month or two at a time. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua said, 
uh, are you for us or for our adversaries? Whose side you're on? Verse 15, keep going. He said, no. In other words, neither one. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Now that's a, a revelation. Whose side are these angels on? <laughs> Yours, theirs, mine, neither. The Lord's. Hmm? As captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he did worship. And he said to him, what says my Lord to his servant? And of all the things he could have said to him, <laughs> what did he say? Take your shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> Loose your shoe from off your foot for the place whereon you stand is holy. And so what Joshua would do? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That'd be disrespectful, wouldn't it? What'd he do? Get those shoes off. Right? Got them off. Why? Because the place that you're standing on is holy, and this was a physical way of showing reverence and showing respect. Do physical things matter? A shoe is a man made thing hmm? that isolates you from direct contact with what you're standing on. Isn't it? Why is this ground holy right here? Why was the ground around that burning bush holy? Why there? Why now? Because the presence of the Lord was being manifested. Is that right? That's what made it different and the day different and the place different. And what's it time to do? Take off, peel off, remove everything man-made. Come on, are you listening? Anything that's between you and direct contact with him. And show respect. And show honor. And so he did so. He did so. Go with me please to Exodus 19. This is the passage in particular that I said is referred to in the New Testament. We're going to see it in just a moment. I'm teaching this in faith. I believe you're receiving it in faith and believing with me in faith. And part of what I'm talking about, we have prayed and we have asked the Lord to show us how to honor him more than we ever have. Is that right? We've asked him this. Why? Number of things. He's a great God. He ought to be honored. Is that right? He's done so much for us. He ought to be revered. And honored, but not only that, we crave more of His presence. Don't we? Come on, am I I'm not just talking by myself. We crave, we hunger and thirst after His righteous presence, not just only to know, no, we shouldn't say, I have to feel Him or I can't walk and do anything. No, we're willing to walk by faith, no matter what we feel or we don't feel. But that doesn't mean we don't crave more of him. Is that more of him manifested in our life? We do, and that's fine. You know, it's just like a, a human being that you love and care about. You can love them, not seeing them, not being around them, not being able to touch them, hear their voice. Doesn't mean you don't want to see them, right? And hear them and touch them. And so we love him. And we're walking by faith now 
To be present in the body is to be absent from the Lord. One of these days, we're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And it's not going to be walking with him by faith. We're going to see him. You're going to see him just like you see in me right now. Hallelujah. You, we can hug him just like we hug each other. We can hear him. How many think it's going to thrill you? Oh yeah. Beyond anything that you've ever heard, thought, seen. But we can yet, even though we're walking by faith down here, there's evidences that God has manifested his presence to different degrees in the earth down here now. Hasn't he? And what we can learn is some of these things are up to us. We can actually initiate some greater manifestation of his presence it's like a lot of things. Some things people think they're just waiting on him, waiting on him, waiting on him. But the truth is, he already told us, if you'll keep my commandments. Didn't he say that? If you'll love me and keep my commandments and do what I tell you to do. What did he say he would do? What did he say? He said, I will manifest myself to you. Let's look in Exodus 19. Exodus 19, we'll start about verse 3. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain and said, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I have bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Does any of this apply to us? We see it's, uh, it's a type that's fulfilled now and in Christ. Has he made us kings and priests? Yes, through faith in Jesus. He said, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. And Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Huh? Huh? Wash your clothes. Huh? See, God's spirit, he don't care about what you wear. <laughs> he don't care. <laughs> What's well, quiet in here, isn't it? Why wash your clothes? Yeah, I heard it. Respect. Hmm? Yeah. If you reckon there was anything they ever cleaned up for yeah. in their life? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Sure. Weddings. Mm -hmm. Right? Some clean up and go to town, go shopping. Was there ever a time when they cleaned up, put on their good clothes? Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you do that for that and you wouldn't do it for God, mm -hmm. what's going on? Amen. Come on. Hmm? There's a lack of respect there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He said, go to the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And you'll set bounds unto the people round about saying, take heed to yourselves that you go not up to the mountain nor touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. You see, 
without the blood of the Lamb, without grace in place, without the blood on the mercy seat speaking on our behalf. Come on, are you listening? Mankind in his fallen sinful state cannot approach close to God. Hmm? That's why he told Moses, don't come any closer. Why? God's too pure. He's too holy. And, and the sin is unacceptable. And the same thing with him. He said, tell them, do not come up to this mount when God comes down on it. When the presence of God comes down, do not go up there. Anything that goes up there is going to die. I don't care if it's a cow or a sheep or you. Right? Right? That's not God trying to be hard and mean and trying to scare people. That's just how it was. Is our God holy? Yes. Is He awesome? Yes. Is He perfection yes. and pure? Yes. And what kind of defilement can abide in His holy presence? We'll see this later. Our God is a consuming fire. Prophets that saw him in times past said he was a fire from his loins down. He was a fire from his loins up. What does fire do? Fire burns up. Chaff, doesn't it? Wood, hay, stubble. It doesn't burn up gold. <laughs> it refines it. He said, take heed. Don't come up. Don't touch it. Verse 13, there shall not a hand touch it, but he'll surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be a beast or a man, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they'll come up to the mount. Moses went down from the mount to the people and sanctified the people. And what'd they do? Come on, help me out. What'd they do? They washed their clothes. Now you think they got those clothes. Now you got to remember, this is pre Electric washer days. <laughs> Pre-tide days. <laughs> so just how clean were these clothes? Huh? Not that clean. If you want to be technical about it. But is that the point? Is it the point that God the Almighty is going to examine exactly how much dirt is remaining on these clothes until they can get them clean to his standard? Is it all about clean clothes? Technically? Obviously not. As clean as you could ever get it. How many think God look at it and go, that's pitiful? <laughs> right? Huh? Because everything down here is tainted by the curse, isn't it? Yeah. By death. There's nothing naturally perfect down here. Amen. It's all been skewed, altered, changed on the molecular level Amen. by the curse, by sin, by death. But how many can see what's going on here? It's the effort. God's coming. Huh? Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all with me on this or not? Yeah. I mean, if somebody just, if somebody said the governor is coming to your house this weekend, Saturday. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> or somebody in the kingdom that you really respect. Huh? Yeah. Uh, they mentioned the Copeland's quality. Let's say Brother Kenneth and Miss Glory is coming to your house this weekend. Huh? How many of you might dust? You might, you might run the vacuum. You might, huh? <laughs> is it because you're scared Miss Gloria is going to come in with a white glove and do this right here? Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, she's not going to do that. Why would it be? Just out of respect, you want it as presentable. Right? You know it's not going to be perfect. They know it's not going to be perfect, but just out of respect, you want to do the best you can. Come on, are you? Did you hear that phrase? The best you can. If you don't do the best you can, 
then there's a lack of respect. You didn't value it enough to go the extra measure. Oh, we'll do that. That's good enough. Well, who are they anyway is what you're saying. They're just people like we are. Ah, they've seen a dirty house before. <laughs> it's, it's not about natural things. We, we know God looks at the heart, but what you do or don't do with natural stuff reveals the heart. Come on, can you see this? It shows. That's why our main objective in the churches is not how much money we can save. You know, we've spent extra money on things. Hmm? Why? Don't want to waste a dollar. But at the same time, can you make it too nice for the things of the Lord? Can you? Should, should you reach out and do the best you know how to do? And the best where your faith is right now, and believe to do it even better next time around, huh? right? Does that does that directly show how much you value something? Yes. yes. And if you say, "Well, whatever, that's good enough, that's close enough, why bother? Does it matter? What does that show? That you don't value it to any great degree." Hmm. It's not worth your effort. It's not worth your time. It's not worth your expense. And that's a lack of respect. Amen. That's a lack of honor. Who's the Lord going to honor? Come on, help me out. Who's, who's he going to honor? Those who honor him. Who's, where's he going to manifest? God's planning on manifesting himself with, uh, in these people's presence in a measure that has never happened on the earth before, physically. And what's the first thing he tells them to do? <laughs> get ready. Hmm? Get ready. How can they get ready? Here's some natural things you can do. Wash your clothes. Right? Clean up. Wipe that dirt smudge off your forehead. Come on. Huh? <laughs> Cut your nails. Get your good robe. Come on, get your good robe. Yeah. You say, well, I know uh, only robe I got, I only got these two. We'll get the good one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Both of them got holes. We'll get the one that's got the least amount of holes. Yeah. Get the good one. Yeah. Get the good one. And get it clean. Wouldn't hurt to put a crease in it. <laughs> Come on, y'all with me or not? Yes. Do we live in a world that says God doesn't care about any of this? God don't care. Really? He used to care. <laughs> when did he change? <laughs> oh, boy. He said, Tell them to get ready. Tell them to wash their clothes. Verse 14, Moses went down from the mount to the people and he sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Now sanctified means set apart. Set apart from the common, from the mundane. Set apart for special use, special purpose. Right? How many understand everything was disrupted down here? Right? It is not Business as usual. Why? God's coming day after tomorrow. <laughs> huh? Tell me what faith does. Oh, y'all are quick. Faith, faith prepares. Faith gets ready. And if God says, I'm coming, get ready. Wash your clothes. Set yourself apart. What do you do? And it's the very act of getting ready, showing the honor and respect, show it, demonstrating the obedience and the faith that gives God a right to manifest himself to you in a way that he's not doing with everybody else. Come on, are you listening? Because no, they're not getting ready and they don't care. And they say he don't care. And they're wrong. 
And the Lord's helping us, saints. Tell your neighbor, say, wash your clothes. <laughs> he said to the people, be ready against the third day and come not at your wives. What does that mean? <laughs> Y'all are quiet. <laughs> well, it means no physical relations. Hmm? Amen. Marriage is God's idea. Amen. No, that's natural. But what? But what's he saying? This is special. Set, set all that aside. Hmm? Amen. <laughs> and it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Hmm? Tell me what's it like throughout the camp? Huh? Clean clothes. <laughs> Is that right? Every tent you go in, clean clothes. Smells good. Right? Looks good. And in the morning, thunders, lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mountain. Anybody know why the cloud has to be so heavy? Because if any of them saw God, they wouldn't be able to live. Hmm? In their present condition. And the voice of the trumpet. And there ain't nobody human on the mount playing the trumpet. And it's loud. How many know God has his own PA system? <laughs> it is. It's what? Loud. Exceeding loud. Now, this is a thought right here. Now, don't, no, don't get carried away with this, young people, but uh, God turns his music up sometimes. <laughs> this is trumpet, and it's loud. It ain't just loud, it's... So that all the people that was in the camp did what? Tremble. Tremble. They're trembling in their clean clothes. <laughs> and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on, on smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke therefore ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And nobody had to ask, when's he going to get here? <laughs> no, nobody asked that. In fact, there was no talking at all. There was trembling. Hmm? Now, friends, let me jump ahead a little bit. The Bible tells us because of what Jesus has done for us, Him paying for our sins, Him giving us His very own righteousness, that now you and I can come boldly unto the throne of God. And we can. And we even have a right to be there. But is God himself any less great and awesome than he was manifesting himself on this day? Then just because we've been given such privilege and such grace and opportunity, should we treat him with any less respect? No. No. Certainly we should not. Keep reading. The whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and did what? Wax louder and louder. Is this an awesome experience? Huh? They're actually quite scared. The whole mountain, the, the, the smoke and fire, it just, just boiling up. And flaming up into the sky beyond you can see. And there's this trumpet. Ain't no mistake in it. This is not just some weird natural sound. This is a trumpet. And it is so loud. And it got louder. And whoever's blowing it is not taking a breath. <laughs> and Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. Hallelujah. 
The Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. What if they'd have ran up in that cloud? They'd have perished. Why? Because the way had not been made to come into his holy presence. Jesus had not been offered. His blood had not been shed. And that's the first thing. Does God care about him? Yes. What's he saying? I mean, for anything else happened, he said, go back down right now and tell them, don't come in to the cloud. Don't break forth. Don't try to look. And let the priest also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to the Mount Sinai, for you told us, you charged us and said, set bounds uh, about the Mount and sanctify it. In other words, we did what you told us to do, and they, they can't get through. And the Lord said to him, away, get you down, and you shall come up, you and Aaron with you, but let not the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. And Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. And God spoke all these words. Anybody know what he said? It's what we call the Ten Commandments. He said, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Go with me to Hebrews 12, please. Hebrews 12. Can you take a little more of this? How does this apply to us? What does this mean? People say, well, it's totally different. That's Old Testament. We're New Testament. God is not totally different. He's exactly the same that He's always been. What has changed is our approach to Him our access to Him because of what our wonderful Master has done. Hmm? He broke down the wall. Hallelujah. He broke down the barriers that separated us from God and God from us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There was nothing in the world, there was nothing in the universe that could do it except for the precious blood of the Lamb. That was the only thing that could buy us, that could redeem us, that could wash us and make us able to go into the very presence of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 12, he's talking about don't refuse correction. Don't reject chastening and chastising. Verse 9, he says, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. How shall we not much rather be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Should we show him reverence? Are we reading in the New Testament now? This is the book of Hebrews, right? Skip on down to verse 18. He says, you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Does the writer of the New Testament want you and I thinking about what we just read about in Exodus? Huh? Does it have any application to us? Yes. Do we know what application it has to us? Well, let's read and get it. He said, you're not come to that physical mountain that can be touched with a hand that burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of that trumpet and the voice of those words, which voice they that heard them entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. You know, after God spoke those commandments, if you read the rest of those chapters where we were, the people came to Moses and they pled with him, please, you go talk to him. Please, don't, if he speaks again, we don't think we'll make it. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> 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 
You go talk to him and you tell us what he, whatever you tell us, we'll do it. And uh, Verse 20, they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it'll be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Who said that? Moses, Moses himself. Now, I don't know what it was like the two or three days before that happened. But when God told them, I'm coming to visit. Hmm? I'm coming to visit. Set everything aside. Wash your clothes. Get ready. Prepare. Wonder how the people talked in their tents. Wonder what they said. They thought, Jehovah's coming. Huh? The Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we've heard about. He's coming. He's coming here to where we're camped out. Oh, God's coming. God's coming. But when he actually showed up, it was different. It was different. You know, again and again, that's the case. When he actually manifests himself, even today in the new covenant, we know we don't have to be afraid that the presence of God will destroy us because of our sin and shortcomings. The blood of the Lamb has cleansed us and washed us. But even so, I've seen the Spirit of God manifest and people get scared. People go, oh, that's strange. Because all they've ever talked about was the theory of the idea of God. Hmm? How many have a hunger? You have a desire for the real God, the real Holy Spirit, not some religious idea what somebody thinks he is, but he himself manifesting himself, huh? In our services, in our bedrooms, in our cars. Come on, are you listening? At our workplaces that you're just doing something and all at once you realize, whoo, he's here. He's here. And again and again, it's going to be different than how you thought. Because he's not just how somebody imagined him to be. He's how he is and how he's always been, which is good and wonderful, but powerful beyond imagination. Keep reading. But verse 22, you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's a natural Jerusalem. There's also a heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels. Angels are part of the manifesting of God's presence. Sometimes in the word, an angel is called the angel of his presence. There are times you'll sense the presence of God, and what it is, is one of his angels that he sent. And then there's the manifesting of the Holy Spirit, but it's all him, because it's the angel of God and it's the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit's not doing his own thing. And these angels are not doing their own thing. How many remember the Bible said the Holy Spirit? He won't even speak of himself. We're come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's what church I'm a part of. Anybody with me? Come on, anybody? Huh? Come on, sit out loud. I'm a part of the church of the firstborn. Who is the firstborn? Anybody know who he's talking about? Jesus is the first one. Didn't say the only one. First one to be raised from the dead, free from all sin and judgment. If there's a firstborn, there's a second, third, fourth, millionth and nineteenth, whatever your number is. And which are written in heaven. Is your name written in heaven? Yes. 
and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What did the blood of Abel cry out for? Vengeance. Justice. Right? Avenge me. I've been wronged. But the blood of the Lamb is not calling out for judgment. The blood of the Lamb is calling out righteous, mercy, grace, clean, innocent. Better things than what Abel's blood was saying. See that you refuse not him that speaks. For if they escape not that refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The next time that happens... Everything that can be shaken from the core of the planet to the height of heaven is going to be shaken. Amen. And when it gets through being shaken, the only thing that will remain are the things that cannot be shaken. His voice then shook the earth, but now he's promised saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Glory. The reason it's just once more is because after that shaking, nothing will be left that could be shaken right. in the future. Amen. What does all that mean? We're going to find out. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God. How? 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 Acceptably with what? With reverence and godly fear. If we have a God that is so mighty, so awesome, so powerful, so wise, so perfect, so holy as this, should we act like it? I said, should we act like it? Yes. What about people who don't believe in God at all? Then they act like there is no God. Right? They don't care if they use names in vain or blaspheme or what they say about him or his or the Bible. Why? Because it's just a bunch of junk. There is no God. He doesn't exist. So they show him no respect and they show him great disrespect. Well, are believers themselves showing different degrees of respect? How much faith you have in him is going to be revealed by what? Come on, help me out. We've been working all night to get here. Huh? How much you faith you have in him is going to be revealed by how much honor and respect you show him. People that trivialize and act like nothing's a big deal, whatever, no biggie. What does that show? They don't know him much. Maybe they are born again. But they, they've had very little experience with him. They really don't know him. I didn't say they were lost. They just don't know who they're talking to. You can tell by the way some people pray. They don't know who they're talking to. Hmm? Yeah. And it's not a matter of being morbid and acting depressed. Hmm? It's just a matter of an increased awareness of who he is and what he is. He's bigger than the mountains. He's vaster than space. Huh? He's more powerful than a billion stars. Do you believe it or not? What kind of being is this? What, who, who is he? What is he? And yet, he knows your name. 
That's right. And cares about you. Hallelujah. Should we show him the greatest respect? Yes. Huh? Yes. Should we honor? Should we do the very best we know how? Yes. To serve him. Read that verse again. What should we do? Receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Do you think there's going to be howling and running and screaming when everything down here is shaken? Yes. Huh? Revelation, you read about it. There'll be people that'll run and yell to the rocks, fall on me and hide me from the face of him that's on the throne. And yet the Bible said when he comes, we're going to meet him with joy. joy. Hallelujah. Why? Because we know him. Amen. We're his. He's ours. Oh, hallelujah. And the kingdom that he establishes manifested outwardly is the kingdom that you and I are already a part of and that we shall rule and reign with him forever and that kingdom will never come to an end. It will not be like all the nations of the earth that have risen and fallen after centuries of millennia. The kingdom of the Lord will endure forever and ever and ever and ever and will never come to an end. It's a kingdom that can't be shaken, a kingdom that can't be moved. And since all of this is true, and he's still the same awesome God that came down on the mount that time, what should we do? Let us have grace. By this grace, we could serve God how? If you can serve God acceptably, what else could you do? Try serving Him unacceptably. Serve God acceptably. What helps you to serve God acceptably? With reverence. And, and not a devilish, worldly, ungodly, tormenting fear, but a godly fear. A godly fear. Why? Read the next verse. Read the next verse. For our God is a consuming fire. Think of the sun. What kind of fire that is. You talk about a consuming fire. How far are we away from it? Ninety some million, ninety-three million miles. And it got pretty warm here in Florida today. <laughs> And it's how far away? What if it was 92 million miles away? <laughs> what if it was only 75 million miles away? I guess we'd be toast. Right? Right? I guess that'd be it. I mean, the oceans would be evaporated and the surface of the earth would be scorched. We've come to find out there are untold millions of stars like our sun. Many of them dwarfing our sun. What keeps all those stars burning? Huh? What keeps all those stars burning and brilliant? for millions and billions of years at a time before they run their course and burn out. The gravitational forces involved in this thing are almost beyond comprehension. The force that's pulling the oceans and their tides and keeping the planets in their orbits and their rotation, the one who made them is far more powerful. He's the one you call Father. <laughs> I want you to say it out loud. My Father, My father is something. Is something. <laughs> My Father, He's not just something, He's everything. He's everything. He's as high as you can go. He's as deep as you can go. He's as far as you can go. He's as great as you can go. And He is light. And He is life. And He is love. And He loves me. 
I may be a speck down here and one of billions from an interstellar perspective, but the one who made it all knows exactly where I am. Come on, do you believe it? He knows exactly where I am. He knows what my name is. He knows what's in my heart. And his eyes are searching to and fro throughout the earth. Come on, tell me, tell me what he's looking for. He's looking for somebody whose heart is all out for him. Perfect means wholehearted. How many want to be all in for God? All, all in. A God like this deserves no less. Right? Then all in. Everything you've got. God's speaking to some people right now. Some people in this room. Some people in Branson. Some people, a number of people watching by the internet. They haven't been all in. They've been sitting on the edge. They've been playing in the world. They had, they've hardly given God any of their life and heart and commitment. And the Spirit of God is calling, saying, come on. Come on. Get in. Get all in. Come on, give me, give me everything. The more you give me, the more I'll use. The more you give me, the more I'll bless. Come on, lift your hands. Say it out loud, oh, Father God. I worship your greatness. I worship your awesomeness. I don't have words to express how great I believe you are. But I ask for grace. And I believe I receive it. Whereby I may serve you in godly fear and reverence. Serve you acceptably with an increasing awareness of your holy presence and knowing that you are a consuming fire. Oh God, we worship you. These churches, everybody that's joined together with us right now, we say we respect you. We honor your presence. We hunger for your presence. We're asking you, manifest yourself in our midst, helping us to honor you and obey you and serve you more than we ever have, that you may manifest yourself in our midst more than you ever have. Because it is written, you have spoken it. Those who honor you, you will honor. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet. Lift up your hands. Oh, lift up your hands. Let's worship him.